Good evening, everyone. Um, like Kelly was telling you, uh, at the end of this, we're going to go through a slide. It's a, it's a PowerPoint slide that's approved by OSHA, right? So um, I didn't build this slide. I'm not sure what's coming each slide. I have an idea. So I will kind of talk to you about it. About it. I'll tell you about inspections and, and different things like that. So some of the slides that you'll see, I might repeat or I might have gone ahead because um, really I'm an open book. Uh, at the end of this, uh, I think it's best when I do these presentations. If you have any questions, you can ask me at that time um, if you had anything. And I'm going to tell you now, I don't, I don't know everything. I cover maritime, I cover construction, I cover general industry, um, agriculture. So um, I can't memorize it all, just like you guys. But if you have a question that I'm not familiar with or, or I don't remember the answer, uh, I'll get back with you on it and I'll get you an answer for it, okay? So I'm out of the Jacksonville area office. Um, I've been with OSHA 10 years now. I'm an engineer for them. Um, typically, you only meet me during an accident or a fatality. That's what I cover um, for investigating purposes. Uh, the purpose here is just tell you, those of you may have had experience with OSHA and you may have not had experience with OSHA. Um, you, you may have heard about it but never seen us come on to a job site. You may have seen us come on to a job site and not been happy about it. That's just the way it is, right? Um, but I'm here to tell you all about OSHA, um, tell you what the act covers, um, the workers that are covered. Um, not everyone is covered under OSHA. Um, tell you a little bit about the process, the inspection process, the employer's rights, the employee's rights. Just kind of, kind of narrow it down all for you and make it where it's, um, it's, it's not this huge thing to try to understand, okay? History of OSHA. Um, obviously, OSHA's been around since 1972, I believe it is. Um, Believe it or not, we have all those inspections on record too. Um, we keep every one of those inspections. And unfortunately, we still keep paper copies, so we don't keep them in the office. You know, every three years, we, we're supposed to cycle them out, send them to archives, so they keep it. Um, if you have an OSHA inspection within the last five years, so uh, after we've archived it after three years, we go to archives to retrieve that information. Um, the act, well, not since 1970, um, President Nixon signed it. This kind of just tells you a little bit about the act. Um, I'm not going to go too much in that unless you're kind of concerned about it, but I think we can move on uh, from there coverage. Um, it just lets you know we are a small agency. When you look at the, the big scheme of things with um, the federal government, OSHA is, is really a, a small agency. Um, so when you see the, I give you an example, when you have federal um, shutdown, um, the federal government, they typically will keep a few of us running anyway um, because you still have accidents, you still have fatalities, but we're just a small portion um, of the overall federal government. Uh, also, I can let you know now, you know, when a company gets, um, gets a penalty, gets fined, that doesn't go into OSHA's budget. That seems to be a misconception with some people. Um, OSHA doesn't get that money. That goes into the general funds. So the ideal is really for you guys to get in compliance, you guys to make sure um, that things aren't, you know, that, that are hazardous to employees out there. Because the fact of the matter is, I can't be at every one of your job sites. And you might have been working 30 years in the industry and never have seen me. Or this is the first time you're ever seeing me. And you're saying, look, man, really? Um, so that, that gives you an idea. We're a small agency. Uh, this is our budget. Um, believe it or not, the last few years, we started getting a little bit more funds in the budget last couple years back, um, I guess three or four years back. Our budget was cut so much, it was almost hard to get pens out of my office. Um, so if that lets you know that uh, we're working on a very, very tight budget. Uh, we have vacancies all the time. OSHA already operates um, uh, with vacancies 
planned, I think, where they don't fill them. So uh, we were constantly, constantly busy with the new laws that came out, um, with the reporting of the accidents. I literally go from one to the next, one to the next. That's how it works. OSHA inspections for two, this is for 2018. Um, total federal OSHA inspections were 32,000. State plan inspections was 40 something thousand. But I'll cover that in a minute. Uh, I think there's another slide on state agencies versus um, um, the federal um, government. Again, Jacksonville and Florida is a federal plan um, state, okay? Uh, you do have, not all states have the, the we have an office, federal office, in every state, right? But it might be a state plan state to where the state oversees it. The um, federal office in that state, we just audit the state plan. So you might have one or two people in there, but as far as um, enforcing, enforcing compliance, that's on to the state, unless it's a federal agency. Um, and then that's when we go in and we would, we would handle that. The mission just to assure safe and um, health work, um, working conditions. These are just some examples of, of things you see. Uh, it's interesting that this slide here with the, the trenches on there, um, I'm considered the, the, one of the trench experts in the office, so if, if you have an accident with a trenching, pretty much guarantee you're going to see me there. Um, Workplace, duty of all employers to provide a, a workplace free of known hazards, um, known dangers. Um, employees have the right to a, a safe and healthy workplace. Who's covered under the act? So this is important. So not everyone is covered under the act. Um, so employee-employer relationship, that's what I look for there. Um, it, it, I think it, on this slide, or it's another slide, uh, the next slide's gonna tell you who's not covered. Um, most private sector employees are covered. I think, I'm, uh, I think this is alluding to the next slide, and I'll explain that, why, why somebody wouldn't be covered under that. Um, any federal agency, we oversee uh, federal agency, although if the federal agency is not in compliance, the federal government doesn't issue itself fines. They still have to correct the hazards, but they're, they're not issue fines because it's, it's literally taken from one hand, putting it in the next. So that's why they don't do that. Um, not covered. Self-employed. So this is if you're self-employed, and, but you don't have any employees working for you, right? Um, and, and that goes into another question. If I come on site and you say, well, this, this guy is just working for me today, then we, we start looking at things called Darden factors and um, do you control the work? Can you control the work? Uh, there's a number of questions I have to ask there. But if you yourself are self-employed, you're exposed to the hazard, you're not covered with a caveat, and it doesn't mention that here, okay? If you're incorporated, if it, you're uh, ABC Incorporated and you're the, the, the sole owner but um, you're the president, you're actually considered an employee of that corporation. Um, so, so that's where it changes. That gets in, it's a little bit of um, a detail. You guys probably won't see it. Farms with only immediate family, uh, that's another question. We do get fatalities on farms, um, and that's that's uh, those are tough, tough inspections. Um, Any time that I deal with fatalities, and it's family members, you might have a husband, wife own a company, and say the the husband is the one who died, but they have employees. We still have to open an investigation with that family, and. Um, and you'd be dealing with a significant other, right? So it's, those are very tough, um, but you still got to... Conditions regulated by other federal agencies, like MSHA, for example. Um, so when I go on site, or um, if I'm, I'm dealing with the Coast Guard, those are things that we have to sit down and we have a discussion. It wouldn't necessarily be that um, the employer and OSHA, OSHA and other agencies to see where the jurisdiction lies. Um, 
maybe there's a memorandum of understanding between the agencies. Um, state, county, and city employees, I hear that a lot. Um, you might go down the road and you see city workers out there and they're in a trench and it might be nine or ten foot deep and you think, why, wow, uh, how are y'all doing? It? They are not under our jurisdiction. We can't do anything about that. Um, And, uh, you know, um, city employees. What does OSHA do? We develop job and safety health standards, obviously. Uh, we en enforce the standards through worksite inspections, um, investigations. Uh, we provide assistance at any time you can call our office. If you have any question about anything, any concern that you're doing or you need to know, you can call our office. You don't have, you don't have to say your name or where you're working or anything like that. I don't, I don't want people to misunderstand that. You can call our office and say, hey, this is what we're dealing with. Uh, what do we need to, to do in order to be um, operating under the correct regulations? Um, so you, you, you can call there, and if you don't, I just tell people, if you don't feel comfortable, just don't leave your name. If you feel like somebody's asking you, well, where's the work site at, or, or what's your name? You don't have to say any of that. You know, you're wanting information, and our office is very good about that. You call us up. Um, you always have a duty officer re rotate. Um, I think it's like four times out of the year we answer phones. So any complaints that come in or anything, people call in. People call in all the time. They say, hey, we got this situation. Um, what do we need to do about that? Uh, obviously, we uh, maintain reporting, record keeping. Your 300, lo 300 logs do not go to our office. Uh, so if you, if you call our office and you have this misconception that your 300 logs are going to the local Jacksonville area office, they are not. We don't have them. Uh, we don't keep them. Uh, when we open up inspection, we'll, we'll ask to see them, you know. Workers' rights, I think we covered that. Um, okay, so this, this is a slide that I wanted to cover, and I, I cover with everyone, and, and it's, it's in... Um, Workers have the right to speak with OSHA in confidentiality. They have the right to speak with OSHA without any retaliatory action. You can't fire them, demote them, change their hours or anything for speaking to OSHA or for what they say for OSHA. They have the right to speak with us in confidentiality. Um, just one-on-one -on -one with OSHA, okay? Uh, they don't have to turn and, and tell what they said to their employer, and at no time can the employer take any action. They're covered under 11C whistleblower protection. Those of you who don't know, OSHA does enforce whistleblower acts. So that's for everything, is including OSHA. Um, but the employees have the right to speak with OSHA and they're covered under whistle, whistleblower protection. I think I, I've seen this confused as well, so I wanted to point out management is covered under whistleblower protection as well. Okay? Management of your company doesn't have the right to confidentiality. If, if you have a supervisor or if you have a manager or a lead crew and, and they're being interviewed by OSHA, you have the right to sit in on their interview. They represent your company. Um, they're speaking um, for your company. You have the right to be in there. You have the right to hear that conversation. Uh, but they also have the right to whistleblower protection. So you can't take action against them for what they're telling OSHA. You can't take action. You can't turn around and fire them because they spoke to OSHA. Um, you could Google that up. We did have a case not too long ago um, where a management spoke with OSHA and um, he was immediately fired for speaking to OSHA. Um, they filed a whistleblower complaint and um, the employer had to had to um, settle with the um, whistleblower and with the uh, management official that was fired. I have one question. Okay. What about if you reverse the situation and the protection for the employer? Um, we had a situation where we had a, an employee terminated and for cause. And as a disgruntled um, employee, he then a couple of days later started filing OSHA complaints against that employer. So what are the employer's rights as far as when something like that happens? So that is a common practice I see, right? 
um, you have a disgruntled person and they may call the office. How I look at it, um, when, I, when I come on to the job site, these are just allegations. I don't know if they, they exist or don't exist. Um, so we need to investigate that. We need to see if they do exist or don't exist. If they exist, we need to correct them because you still might have other people exposed to the hazard, right? Uh, so if they're valid, let's get them corrected. But if they're not valid, um, we'll close the case and we'll move on. But there's nothing for me to say that somebody can't call our office and report a safety or health um, violation, okay? And OSHA doesn't tell you that you can't um, terminate your relationship with an employee because they're doing something against the company's rules, right? But you can't terminate them for reporting uh, a self, uh, safety violation um, to OSHA, okay? Um, or for notifying OSHA of that. Uh, with that being said, we have two types of complaints when you call our office. It's called formal and non-formal, okay? So not every complaint comes in our office. Um, we're gonna go investigate. The director, um, who is Michelle Gonzalez now, I'm not sure if any of you've had opportunity to meet her. She has limited resources, right? We might have 10 officers and we just do accidents um, around the clock. When you get into fatalities, I may be at your job site two weeks, I may be at your job site a month. Um, I did one fatality investigation, I interviewed over 50 people and with OSHA I don't get to record, I have to write your statement down. So, you know, my finger's swollen going from morning to evening, taking everybody's statements. So the 11C uh, is, is important that you understand that you can't take action against um, the employee for speaking with us. You can't, you can't take action against management if they told OSHA, yeah, we have a safety issue or something. Um, we got safety hazards, okay? But you do have the right to be in on those conversations, okay? You have 30 days to, to um, call our office if you feel like you've um, um, been retaliated against. I can let you know now, it's, um, that will be passed. We have a, a whistleblower um, group, that, that's all they do. Basically, we got one in our office that covers the whole area. Um, they, they have a broad jurisdiction. <coughs> Um, and for unfavorable personal actions such as um, firing, laying off, blacklisting, demoting. Uh, I think I pretty much covered it. Um, reducing pay hours. I think we saw this one. Provide workplace recognized hazards. Need to provide training to your employees. Um, I'm going to tell you on that when, when you say it, we provide training. When I come on site, this is typically how it is. If it's not in writing, it doesn't exist. So if you do training, you need to document it. If it's a toolbox training, document it. I mean, it, it doesn't have to be anything fancy. You could have sheet, sign-in sheets and topics that you cover. Um, it, it can be that simple, but you need to show documentation of training and of training your employees, okay? Question. On the 11C, is that the same 11C that's used for the Department of uh, all the departments in the United States government? All right, so your, que your question is, is that the same same form that they use for 11C? Right. I don't know what form they use. I know in our office we have a certain form that comes in that we fill out that we will forward um, to the administrator of the 11C. Out of our office, everything goes to Atlanta, Atlanta Georgia. That's where our, our regional office is. And then the um, director, if you will, I'm not sure what his title is. Uh, he'll send it out to the appropriate area, wherever the complaint is. Okay, and so then the investigator for the 11C will go. So is hearsay provided? If somebody provides hearsay, is they still get the 11C protection? In other words, they didn't see it. They didn't witness it, but they heard. 
so the person hearing it, are they an employee? Yes. Say there's an employee that heard that something was going on, but didn't witness it, didn't directly know, have knowledge of it. Okay, so I'm not I'm not really going to answer that. Okay. Um, that's that's going to be out of my my realm of knowledge. If if you have a whistleblower complaint, we'll take the whistleblower complaint and we'll forward it. Sure. And then the guys who who do whistleblower complaints, they can decide how they're going to pursue with that. Thank you. All right, it took me a minute. I'm a little slow, so um, it took me a little minute. If you are, um, if you do receive a citation, I think we'll go over this in a, in a later slide. If you receive a citation, you'll need to post those citations in a place that employees can see it. Normally, you have a bulletin bar, I mean, a, a bulletin board or um, an area where the employees might gather for work that morning. You just need to post it for three days or until it's abated so that the employees can see it. Um, Okay, so I jump. I just I want to make sure we cover the inspection. I'm not sure what slide that is on. Um, I think I saw it in here earlier, but I'll let you know that employers employer has a right to after every OSHA investigation. Um, typically, we'll give you a pamphlet of employers' rights and responsibilities. We've kind of gotten away from that in the last. I have gotten away from it kind of, um, and I know my office maybe the last seven years. Um, so yes, um, but what they do is now they'll send it to you in the package with the citation, and uh, it, it covers the employer's rights and responsibilities. It will cover. Um, it explain the difference in a uh, a willful, serious, um, other than serious de minimis. It also gives you the penalty amounts uh, for each one of those items. Uh, if the pamphlet's updated, if it's a 2017, it, it's not going to, it's, um, the penalties change every year. So unless it's a 2019 version, you're not going to see the correct penalty amount. This is what I explained earlier. There's, here's the standards here, the areas that we cover, general industry, construction, uh, maritime, agriculture. Um, depending on what you d are doing at the time, also um, it might fall into general industry versus construction. Um, maritime, you, you might, I might go onto a site and it might be a port, but an area of operation is going to fall under general industry. It's not all going to fall under maritime. Um, so I have to see what you're doing um, and what the process is, okay? General duty clause, if there is, uh, if we don't have a specific standard that applies, but it is a, a recognized hazard in the industry, um, you could be cited under the 5A1 general duty clause, okay? Um, so I, I give you an example of that. Uh, Kelly had mentioned doing inspections, okay? So let's say you, you don't have a standard that applies to this, this one particular piece of equipment that you have. Let's say an ANSI standard applies to it or an ANSI standard addresses that. That would be something that falls under the 5A1. But um, most recently, I'll give you an example, an ANSI standard might tell you you need to follow the manufacturer's recommendations on this piece of equipment. And the manufacturer recommends you do something to this piece of equipment or there could be structural failure from not doing that. That would be, that would be something that falls under a 5A1 general duty clause, okay? Types of inspections, um, here this is, is kind of the order that it falls in um, as far as uh, how we're directed. Uh, um, danger, fatalities, hospitalizations. Fatalities hospital um, is normally what I see a lot, employee complaints. Um, 
fall under that. The director, I think I told y'all this earlier that just because a complaint is filed doesn't mean you're gonna see us. She has limited resources. So she has to look at the complaint and the complaint items. Now, if it falls under an LEP or an REP, most likely there is going to be an inspection. We have emphasis, local emphasis program, regional emphasis program. That's what I mean by LEPs or REPs, okay? Uh, referrals, if I get a referral from the Coast Guard, I get a referral from the police department or fire department, sometimes we have accidents and the employer doesn't report it. We, get the, uh, we might get the referral from the media. Um, those are what we are called referrals. It may be that I go onto the job site, I have to do a health referral for an industrial hygienist to come out there and take samples of, of whatever you might be dealing with. Program inspections, this is where I talked about the regional emphasis program, local emphasis program, national emphasis programs, be like forklifts. We have a, a emphasis program in forklifts, um, falls, anytime we see employees working at heights without fall protection, trenching is a, a, a big program. We have emphasis program, and in fact, last year, um, they've even put more emphasis on it because we have a high rate of fatalities. Follow-up inspections. The office determines, the director determines where we do the follow-up inspections, but typically we do 15% of the inspections that we do or investigations that we do throughout the year um, are scheduled for a follow-up. That's when we come on site and ensure the abatement that you provided or told us that you had put in place, that you're doing it or um, have that in place. Uh, failure to do that um, could lead to a failure of abatement citations. Here's some of the national emphasis programs. Um, I'm not sure if you guys deal with any of this. It'd be lead, uh, metals, PSM is covered, ship breaking, um, silica, amputations, that's another one. We get what is called an amputation list. List comes to us, it's a, it's a random um, sites. It, it, the sites we get are random, but it's kind of based on the um, your 300 logs, your accident records, and, and compared to your national average. So we would get that, and we get a random um, list of that. You might be in an industry that, that pertains more. Uh, I, see more I see more of that in manufacturing. Um, target inspection programs. Uh, another thing we have is construction targeting. Uh, you guys might have seen that um, or have heard of a Dodge report. Um, a Dodge report, it just tells you where the project is, how much the project is, the contractor, and things like that. We get a random sample sent to us again. Uh, Tennessee used to do it. I'm not sure who does it now. We get a random sample of those, and it's a list, and we just go to the site to check it out. Uh, sometimes your project's just starting. Sometimes your project's in. Sometimes... Um, the project's no longer going. Uh, again, it's a random sample. Region 4. Uh, so these are the states that are in Region 4. If you, if you kind of, I know we have a map. Um, not, well, never mind, they have it for Florida. So for Region 4, uh, our office, our regional office is out in Atlanta, Georgia. And so for our region, we cover Alabama, Florida, Georgia, Kentucky, Mississippi, North Carolina, South Carolina, Tennessee. So the, the asterisk there, without reading this, is going to be um, state plan states. That's going to be Kentucky, North Carolina, South Carolina, Tennessee. So, uh, and, and we have a small office in those state plans, maybe one, two people. It's just to audit the state plans. But uh, if you have a fatality on a... Um, let's say um, a federal agency at a federal agency or, or work site, um, we will go in there. Regional emphasis program, maritime inspection. So um, if you guys, if, if that's what you're involved with, we do get a list of, of um, 
Uh, what I have seen is um, marinas that we go to. I know that they have some sites, but I haven't seen much of them. Uh, the falls in construction. Again, landscaping, I forgot about that one. Um, ship, boat, um, building and repair. Um, forklifts uh, is what I called um, powered industrial trucks. Um, federal agencies, poultry plants. Uh, I, I personally only know of one poultry plant in for Florida, um, but I'm originally from Mississippi, so uh, we, we have them there. Jurisdiction, so the top half of this where you see Jacksonville, so we have three, we have three area offices in the state of Florida. Uh, we have a lot to cover in the state of Florida and, and we have a lot of fatalities. So the Jacksonville area office, how I kind of explain it, I just tell people um, south to Volusia County where we're at now, right, in west, and the whole panhandle. So if you can imagine roughly 10 of us and we do accidents and fatalities, we're literally going from one place to the next. Um, it, it's nonstop. The middle part of the state is covered by Tampa, then you have Fort Lauderdale on the south, um, south part. So again, if, you are, um, if you're working, say, in Polk County and um, somebody was to call a complaint in, that's going to go to the Tampa area office. If you, you could call Jacksonville area office, if you don't know Tampa's number, you could call them and they'll just direct you to Tampa or they might just take the complaint and forward it to Tampa themselves, okay? These are just the counties that the Jacksonville area office covers. I think it's better just to, to say to Volusia County and West in the, the panhandle. I think it gives you a better idea, personally. Uh, all right, how, how are the uh, ocean inspections conducted? So the OSH Act authorizes the OSHA compliance officer to conduct, to conduct inspections at reasonable times. Um, reasonable times, um, if, if I come on site and say it's, it's uh, the end of the work day, everybody's gone, um, I will still open up with you and then um, depending on the situation, depending on what it is, all this is, is the, you know, is case by case. We may meet again in the morning, I'll say that's, that's fine, I, I understand no one's here, we're not going to call everybody back, we'll just, we'll just meet up in the morning and address, address the items. Um, you don't get advance notice. It's illegal for us to give you advance notice or anyone else to give you advance notice. Uh, OSHA just shows up to the job site. If, it's, um, if they believe that employees are, are in danger of getting hurt prior to us, they might give you a notice, okay? Fatalities, if you call, typically you know we're coming. Um, some companies prepare for that. Larger company, they, you know, they'll have, they'll have um, management there to meet you. Uh, obviously, you know if you have fatality, we're about to show up. Uh, yeah, well, in fact, advance notice by OSHA um, can receive fines or prison time. All right, so when, whenever anyone, this is, a, this is uh, whenever anyone comes on site and, and you guys are out here in the job field, right, um, and they say, hey, I'm with OSHA, and I, I kind of stress this point to you a little bit because we've had an instance or two happening in the panhandle where the hurricane come through, right? So if somebody comes on your job site and they tell you they're from OSHA, they're going to have a badge like this, okay? And they call them credentials, right? They have to show you their credentials. Um, they should have these credentials. Uh, what I also tell um, employers too, I don't have a problem if you say, well, well, hold on just a second, I want to make sure you are who you are, even if I saw that. You can call the Jacksonville area office and say, we, hey, we have um, Michael Ussery, he's saying he's here from OSHA. Um, he's opened up an investigation or inspection. We just want to verify who he is. No problem with that. That is not um, that is not refusing an inspection or an investigation, whatever it is. 
Um, I tell people that, and I, I know that um, I've, I've dealt with a complaint in the panhandle where somebody just shows up, they say that, uh, they start asking them a little bit more questions. Um, the, the health and safety person in charge of the company, it was a large company, they kind of know the process and they saw some discrepancies there um, and they started to ask that, um, ask those questions and the guy bolted out of there. Uh, now impersonating the officer, that's a, that's a different circumstance there um, that that person, you know, um, may have to deal with. So any, my point is, they'll identify themselves, and if, and if, um, if you feel like it's questionable or you're not sure, um, just call the office, okay? They're going to explain to you the reason they're there. They're going to have what is called an opening conference with you. Um, they'll tell you why they're there. Um, they'll need some information, such as the company, um, company name, address, if you, if you are to get a, a citation, um, they'll need to know, you know, you know where to send that to. Uh, they'll, they'll ask to speak with management, get management in there. If, if you as a company are there, during that opening conference, it's good if management is there. If you can't get there, if you're located somewhere else, just you can do it over the phone. You can be in on that opening conference over the telephone and um, hear what he has to say. I also, I recommend everyone that I open up with, if, uh, if you're, you're the safety director for this company, or maybe you're the owner of the company and this is a crew out here, um, what I tell you to do is your management on site, if I take a picture, you take a picture, because, or, or you, your manager take a picture, um, because what happens is, um, I'm open. If I take a measurement um, and I take a photo, you take a measurement, you take a photo. Because when you and I talk, we need to be on the same page. And I, and I say, look, this is what we're looking at. You know, you know exactly what I was looking at. You know exactly what I was talking about. It really just helps the communication. It helps it for me, but it also helps it for you so you know, know what's going on, okay? Those are things I recommend um, when I come on site. Uh, it's not mandatory. I'm just letting you know since you happen to be talking to me, um, that's what I would recommend if you ever dealt with that. <laughs> Penalties. This is, a, this is old, although I think the PowerPoint's not but like two months old, but um, the penalties changed a few years back. And, and I, I think most people would, uh, saw that. And then they go up every year with inflation. I think they're around, for serious violations, $13,634 like or something like that. Um, I can't remember the numbers because they change a lot. You know, they change now all the time, so I, I just don't keep up with it. Um, you do get reductions. And the penalties, if, if, you're, if you're to be cited, you get reductions on the size of the company. So it's important when you're speaking to me, when I say, well, how many employees do you have? And you say, look, I don't know, we got 50-something employees. That's going to make a difference on the reduction of that penalty. So you need to be accurate about it. Now, I'm not telling you to lie about it because I will follow up on you and request employee records. Um, but you certainly don't need to boast a big company if you don't have all these employees and it's going to be the, the number of employees you have within the last year okay the highest number of employees so you'll get reductions based on that you could you could get reductions if you have a safety program um, what type of safety program do you have in place what are you doing what type of training you're doing and things like that the third reduction would be um, any inspections within the, the last uh, five years so if you had an inspection, you're in compliance, uh, if you were to get cited again, you should get a 10% decrease for that. Um, but if you had been cited for a high grader within that five years, it's going to be a 10% increase. Question. Uh, would insurance company inspections come into play with any of that? If they're a corporate home or their liability carrier, have sent loss control out to and they had a record of that loss control? So, I, I, so, I, so there was a lot of questions there, OK? Um, so I might answer the first one that I can follow and then you can break it down for me because when you start talking about the workers' comp. Um, 
I understand that, that insurance companies do go out and do inspections for their clients. Um, I always tell the employer, most definitely provide that, because um, sometimes you might be doing toolbox talks. That insurance is doing an unannounced inspection. Maybe, maybe not. Maybe you are asking them where are you at, right? But that's, a, that's a, another set of eyes to say, hey, we are doing all we can do. We, our insurance company comes out here as well, and they look over our site and, and help, they help out. And if they notice something, we correct the hazard immediately. Um, so I always recommend people provide that if that's what they're doing. Not all insurance companies provide that. I have seen that. Uh, some do, some don't. It, earlier I told you about the follow-up inspections and we come out there to ensure that you've done what you said you're doing. That's where the, the failure to abate comes in, um, right there. And it's, it's and now it says 12934 but obviously it's the, the serious price, right? That's per day. Um, so it, it, it can add up, and that's not good. Um, let me cover this right here. You also have other than serious citations. Um, this is a little misleading. This, this penalty is not for an other, other than serious. An other, other than serious citation, exactly what it is. It's other than serious. There's not a penalty amount that comes with that. Uh, it is more of putting you on notice, you know, let's, you got this issue, uh, let's, let's correct it. Um, if you don't correct it, um, you could possibly start seeing some fines on that, even if it's still an other than serious citation. So maybe an example of other serious citation is you're missing some documentation, you have all the other elements and maybe you lost it, the documentation the paperwork. You know, after interviews, we discovered, hey, um, you are doing everything that you, that you said you're doing. You just lost the paperwork for this person or something like that. That could be another than serious, okay? Willful repeat, uh, 129. So if it's a willful citation or, um, so I'm going to kind of break this down for you, okay? A willful citation, uh, it, as of this time, it was $129,336. I mean, that's, um, that's, a, that's a heavy fine, obviously. Uh, repeat citations, they're not necessarily going to start at 129 They can go up to that amount is, is what this slide is saying here because a repeat citation... Uh, it, it, it all depends. There's factors that go into that. If it's a first repeat, second repeat, uh, the gravity um, of the, the, the hazard, you know, the probability of it happening, uh, all those factors come in play there. Uh, a willful citation, and I'll explain this to you. So uh, it, it, a willful citation would... Um, give you an example, you know it's hazardous. So let's say you're doing a trench and you have guys down there in the hole and they're 10 feet down and you've been doing this for 30 years, you're a competent person, um, you instructed them to go down there. Um, there's, a, there's a whole series of questions I'm going to ask you. Um, and I can tell you it, it, it's going to be a tough interview. Uh, it's not going to be a tough interview for me. Um, but it, it's going to be tough because if you, if you know you're exposing employees to a hazard, um, that's where you could be cited for a willful citation, okay? Because the question is, why are you doing that? Um, so I, another example would be of a willful, if I come on site and we have a fatality, right? And you remove the guard off of this piece of machinery that an employee has got called into. And um, you know, why would you remove the guard? Why don't y'all have the guard on there? Well, we can produce more widgets like that. You know, did you know it was a hazard? Yeah, but you know, we get more product going. That's a problem. Um, it's a severe problem for you. 
uh, if, if that happens twice too. Um, willful citations, if there's a fatality, uh, that's when it's possibility that you may be looking at um, time for that. That, that could go criminal um, depending on, on the situation. I'm just kind of giving you a broad view of it, right? Um, it all is a case by case. It's, it's going to be our conversations. Um, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to let you know another thing. At, at this point, whenever you're, you're speaking um, with a federal officer, when I'm taking your interview statement, it's important to be honest. Uh, there's, there's no need to lie if, if it's an accident, it's an accident and, and we'll deal with it. If the company gets cited, they, they can go in the office, they'll have some options, okay? That's part of the process. Uh, if a company gets cited, you can go in and um, you could pay the citation in full. I never recommend that. I always recommend you go talk to the director um, explain what's going on, have that conversation. That's, a, that's called a, an informal conference um, where you go in and speak with the director. By. And the third, you can contest. That's when it takes it out of the hands of the office and it goes, um, goes to the attorneys in Atlanta, okay? Um, where was I at? I, got, I, got, um, I wanted to explain that process to you. Uh, oh. So when I'm, I'm taking your statement, um, or any officer, it's important to, to be truthful because at that point, um, whenever we come on site, that's a federal investigation. And uh, what happens is um, you could be held liable for um, falsifying information, misleading a, an investigation, um, omitting facts during an investigation and, and um, you could get in some serious trouble about that. Uh, I can let you know you, you can easily Google that um, about people who have lied during OSHA investigations um, prior and you can, you can kind of see. Uh, that is something that the office takes separate and I, I let them, uh, management know that, that they will pursue that separate but the case with the company is still going to go forward. So. I mean, just be honest about it. The, the, the goal here is to correct hazards to ensure that we don't have employees exposed to the hazards anymore. That's, that's the ultimate goal. And I can't be at every one of your job sites anyway, right? So it, it's best if you take that on and you make sure it's a safe work environment. I think I got off penalties a little bit. I, I know I'd get off a little bit here. Uh, the top 10 most cited standards in um, 2017. Uh, fall protection in construction, obviously fall protection is going to be a top one because we got an emphasis program in that, right? We have a number of fatalities from falls from heights. We still have a number of fatalities. Um, the economy is doing great, right? So accidents are going up because more people are working. Um, hazard communication, scaffolding. That's another, that's a, uh, another thing, uh, scaffolding, uh, is, it, it becomes an issue. Lockout, tag out, I see more of that in manufacturers, ladders, um, forklifts, machine guarding, um, manufacturing again, fall protection training, electrical. Injury and illness, record keeping, if you have more than 10 employees, you must maintain a record. So if you come on site and you have less than 10 employees and you don't keep OSHA logs. Um, small employee exemption, 10 or fewer at all times during the year. Low hazard industries, they get exception. Um, okay, so fatalities have to be reported to OSHA within eight hours. Um, so within eight hours of, a, um, of an accident happen, of a fatality happen, you have to report it to OSHA. A lot of times the, uh, it'd be homicide or, or um, the fire department or somebody um, for emergency response is going to report that to our office. And they might hold the scene once they, once they release the scene and they verify 
nothing criminal has happened, OSHA takes over jurisdiction at that point. Uh, within 24 hours is inpatient hospitalizations, amputations, loss of eye. Uh, there is a difference between an amputation and an avulsion. Um, if it's an avulsion, um, you would need to speak with a doctor about that because sometimes I know at one point they would just classify everything as amputation, but you don't have to you don't have to report an evulsion to the office. So that might be some of the skin pinched off, right? Um, you really have to have to um, ask the doctor about that. Amputations, you do have to report it um, within 24 hours. Also, I I don't I don't see that. Um, I do see a lot of this, and I certainly see that all the time. This is the, um, it, it, the electronic submission of the OSHA 300 logs. Um, the final rule replies, ah. so this, this regards the submittal of the 300 forms. Um, 250 more employees, 20 to 240 are classified in certain industries with historical high rates. Um, they must submit them. Maintaining your injury and illness records must be maintained at the work site for at least five years. If I come on to your job site um, and I ask for your OSHA logs, I'm looking for your OSHA logs for that job site. I'm not sure if any of you guys are general contractors. If, if you have, um, you might have multiple sites out there. Um, that's where it kind of applies there. Posting is from February through April. Untrained workers, um, it's important that you, that you have trained workers. If, if you guys like that picture, I've got, I've got hundreds and hundreds. It's, um, it's, it gets... Here's some resources you can go to. Obviously, you can always go to OSHA.gov. Um, I give you another thing I tell people. You can go to OSHA.gov if you're wanting to know if this establishment or this company has been cited by OSHA before or if you're looking to hire them to do work for you. Um, we have an establishment search there. You can search that, that company and it brings up um, if they've been inspected, how many times they've been inspected, and it shows you the citations um, that are along with that inspection, okay? Uh, I know this is not on here. I'm just expanding on areas that, that I, I think of if you hire, because if you hire a subcontractor, um, you can always be um, cited as well as the controlling employer or creating employer. It's under our Multi-Employer Worksite Act. Um, you always have possibility of being cited as well, being the controlling employer. So if, if you hire this guy, you subcontract them out to do this work and you're overseeing it and you're allowing the hazard to exist too, um, you can certainly be pulled in and be cited um, as well for exposing his employees to the hazard. I'm not sure if you guys are aware of that. Uh, in fact, I think um, Florida Safety Council might have a um, might have a partnership with OSHA. I'm not sure. I don't get involved uh, much into the um, outreach with the the other. Um, other areas, that's that's really more the director or assistant area director. Um, they get involved with that. But that is the safety councils of um, North Florida. Uh, Art Museum Drive, that's the one that's right, this one right here is right beside our office. University of South Florida. Uh, they, so if you guys are looking for a safety program or if, if I don't think they go to construction sites from my understanding, but if you do have a, like a site that you're at or a manufacturing site or something, they can come in for free of charge. They come in and do a, uh, basically an OSHA inspection. They do a walk through the site. They can do a wall to wall for you. Um, they, can, they can show you all the hazards. They can show you how to correct them. Uh, it's free of charge. 
um, for small employers. I think a small employer doesn't have it up there. If I remember right, I don't know. Last time I said it was 250. For some reason, I thought somebody said 500. Maybe it's more like 250 is what is considered a small employer. But it's free of charge, and it's between you and them. It's not. Um, they don't turn around and give that report to us. They don't turn around and tell us, hey, we found this, this, and this. They're not doing this and that. Um, that's between you. If OSHA comes into your facility because of something else, uh, you're not required to give that report. You're not, don't turn around and say, hey, University of South Florida, this is what they found. Um, that's not, that's between you and them. The ideal is they get a grant from OSHA to do this free of charge for smaller employers to help you guys get in compliance. It's not to try um, to say, hey, we got you or anything. So that's really between you guys. Does it help us to do, do that if something then later happens and that's on record that we did it? So that's not a record we're going to see. So that's a good point, right? That's, that's why I was telling you. If, if I come in there, don't don't go bringing this booklet out and saying, um, um, yeah, look look, you can look at all these items too. Um, that is for them to help you. That's between um, the two of you, um, University of South Florida, uh, and it's free of charge for smaller employers. They're not going to ask you for any money or anything. They have a goal to reach and, and reach these people. My 10 or so years, I think I've only seen maybe three or four companies that even knew about them when I opened an inspection with them. USF, they were three years ago or four years ago, they came in and were a speaker here for the Florida Marine Contractors Association. Their program does extend to the marine contractors. It is free, and they have a part of the program that if they can go through and, and certify you for OSHA certified, then OSHA cannot come and inspect you for up to a year after that certification unless there's a fatality. So they have the program. I have the information on the program. It's it's pretty intense, but if you go through it, I mean, it's it's free. It, it's and we haven't had not one marine contractor sign up for it. And I'm not sure of the details. I, I, so I want, um, if you had an amputation or an accident, even if it wasn't a fatality. Um, um, I don't believe that's going to stop. There was something in the workshop that they gave, but I have information on it that I can send out. Right, from like scheduled inspections, because like Maritime um, or Lamphasis program, so uh, they're certainly, I mean, why wouldn't you use them? They're free. And that's what I tell everybody. I mean, if, especially, if they're just free. Why wouldn't you use them? Um, Yeah, you know, I don't know. You can contact them. Um, I don't really have any contact with USF, um, but I, I do know they have the program. I do know they get a grant to come do it. Uh, they did have a speaker come and he kind of talked to us about, I think because they got a new director or something maybe here recently and they wanted to tell us about it. But most certainly, I would use them. Um, and this looks like their, their information. If anybody wants that, um, we have a hotline for re reporting um, accidents, you know, because we're not open 8 to 5. I mean, we're open from 8 to 5, but the uh, important part about that is that I pretty much work 24-7. So if there's an accident on Saturday, Sunday, um, I've gone out at 2 o'clock in the morning. I've worked from 12 to 6 in the morning. Um, I don't have, we don't have, um, you know, ideally, we're, the office hours are, I think, from 8 to, to 4.30, maybe 8 to 5. But I tell people I, I, I just don't have any set hours. I'll start in the morning, and sometimes I'm working till night. I mean... People are working. They're working at night. Uh, I might be on a bridge. I might be in an accident. Um, that's just how it is. But the point in this is that we have an 800 line. If you have an accident, you have a fatality, you need to report it. So this this might, um, if anything that you, you've been thinking you want to ask or, or anything you wrote down. All right. I'm dying. What is the status of the crane operator certification requirements as far as penalties? 
So our, our penalties are the, we don't have a um, separate penalty. But Last year we were told that your crane operators had to be, your crane operators legally had to be certified, but OSHA wasn't fining for it yet because there was some type of illegal battle going on on the backside. And then what they, what the last update that I had gotten was that at this point in time, and this was from Buddy, that at this point in time, and this was five months ago, um, that the crane operator certification is technically required. They're not necessarily fining for not having the certification, but they're fining for not having training, but not the actual full certification. So long as they, your, your crane operators were trained on the crane, you have documentation that they were trained, that they're not necessarily citing yet for them not having the certification at hand. Not, a, not applying a penalty to it yet, right? Correct. And that, that I don't know what it is. Um, you'd probably be better speaking to Buddy about that um, okay. because that's going to be more in, in their realm of influence of what they're, they're keeping up with, um, okay. whether it cites or not. It really has gotten to where so if I, I come on site and I, I notice a hazard, I put it into a system, I, I call it a database system, it's called OIS, um, but basically it, it automatically generates it. Now that's why I told you on the penalties, I don't, I don't keep up with them um, because frankly I don't go in there and put a number for the penalty, that's automatic generated based on um, the size of the company, the history of the company, safety program, things like that. It automatically generates, it gives you a discount, things of that nature. And then did anybody ever get, address the situation with the inspection logs for your track with back hose excavators? Hmm? No, but that's in your, it, that's one of the things of documentation for other equipment that um, is in the program. What about that? If it lifts. Do they differentiate between a crane and an excavator, or a, or even a um, backhoe? So what, what I'll refer you to on, on that is you, if, if you have a manufacturer and it requires you to... Um, I can't hear you, what did you say? I tried it with a couple of manufacturers, I didn't get anywhere. They didn't respond to you? They, they responded, but we don't do that. You have to find somebody to... Oh, they don't do the inspection for you. Okay, do, do they require the inspections to be done? What, what I heard originally was, if it lifts, it needs to be certified. And I think if it lifts over, uh, I don't know, six, five or six thousand pounds. Do you have anything? That's a different. That's different than what I was. Than what we started off talking about. It's if you have an excavator, track hoe, back hoe, are you required to have an inspection log? similar to that of a crane. I tried to get and an answer to that. No, but he was getting ready to answer. Oh, I'm sorry. So that's that's where you would look for your um, manufacturer's recommendation, it'd be in your operator manual. They don't, they don't recommend you inspect um, X, Y, and Z um, throughout the year or annually. So I give you an example, they might tell you that you need to torque the bolts um, annually. Do they have anything like that? I, I don't know the piece of equipment. We were more worried about the t certification of the operator. And I, any, all the manufacturers that we, you know, we use John Deere and we use Cat So you, so they, they had no answer for that. So you're asking, does the excavator have to be certified to run the excavator? Because it lists the machine. Yeah. yeah, I mean the, the operator that's... Cable and put it in the bucket and you lift something off the ground. You're doing the same thing. Let me check on that for you and I'll, I'll shoot you an email on that. We're just not sure. I know, that, I know if you're working on base, if it's a, a government job or a city job, a lot of times it falls under the board engineer regulations, the M385. Um, in those cases, you do have to have a certified operator. Depending on what it is, if it's an excavator, or track hoe, back hoe, um, you can get certification through some of the, like we use um, tri lane rentals in Georgia, they used to do some of and actually um, have a bobcat, a little bit of certification course. Yeah, 
And all, all you have to do is you go to your guys sit down for a day to three day course on it, uh, depending on what the what machine you're in. Each company certifies its equipment. Right. And so under the EM385 rules, the Army Corps rules, um, you know, if I get certified on a uh, Bobcat skid steer, uh, any similar equipment, I can still operate, but it, it can't be something, you know, within so many tons of lift or things like that. There's, there's certain regulations there, but definitely check the EM385. Right, and on the other side of that too, though, is when you have equipment, it's just like vehicles. So if you have a 2019 vehicle and it has a warranty, and that warranty says in order for this warranty continue to cover you for the next five years, you have to have the oil changed every three hours, you have to have this done, that done, this done, these belts changed, these lug nuts tightened, your equipment, your excavators and things have those manuals also that say in order for us to guarantee or warranty this equipment, you have to do this, this, and this. If there's a failure on that equipment and somebody's injured and OSHA comes out, you have to be able to show logs that you have maintained that equipment in the order that the manufacturer has recommended and required. And if you don't, then that puts you into a whole other section of problems because you did not maintain your equipment. So if, if you do have the manufacturer recommending you, you do those things, um, and we don't have a standard that specifically addresses that piece of equipment, that's what I was telling you earlier, that's where it falls under the 5A1 um, general duty clause. And if that, that um, whatever maintenance that you're not doing um, could cause serious injury, um, you could be cited under 5A1. Thank you. We have a new messaging system we use on the it's an app on the phone called Telegram. We can get all the messages out to our employees at one time. It's kind of like a tech which is real effective. We then started using that to send out YouTube training videos to all of them. If we have that in record in the messaging system, would that act as a in the in writing? So, so what? So I've seen a lot of companies go to the electronic, um, and in fact, where where they do a lot of their training on there, and, and I like that, but. If I came on site, what I would ask you, you would turn around and show me, hey, we, we sent this. Um, in fact, we probably sent it five times, right? I'm going to ask you, how do you know this person watched it? Well, now, Telegram actually has a where you can go and see that they've seen one. So you can document. They Do they have a sign-off where they can, like, sign it that no, they've taken the... Yeah, I would follow that up and make sure because those are the questions I'm going to sit down and ask you. I'm going to see that, that, that you're sending that out. And I'm going to say, that's great. That's great. Um, did you verify it? How do you verify it? Um, that's, that's the same as you, you training your employees and you're telling them to go out and be safe. And, but my questions are going to be, how do you know they're being safe? Do you ever do unannounced inspections? Do you ever just show up to the job site? check on things. Um, I, I'm not sure what industry you are. Um, what, what do you? I'm a marine contractor. Okay. Um, so if you, you're sending your guys off um, to do something, um, I would suggest you put in place, if you haven't, some unannounced inspections where you just go by. You might already do that already just to, to verify where they're at or to bring them tools or something. At that same time, it doesn't have to be, that's right, you can write something down, you can address any safety concerns you have, document it. That's unannounced inspections. You're showing up doing that. But when you come to OSHA, um, it needs to be in writing. You need to be able to show that. So you don't get to talk to me typically unless you have an accident fatality. You sure you don't have any questions? I mean, we could talk about anything you want to. I'm fine with it. So if we have somebody that an uh, OSHA officer goes to do an inspection because of a complaint of a safety violation or something, what happens if the contractor just tells you no? You're not inspecting my site. Okay. You can do that. Um, I wouldn't advise it because it... <laughs> Um, but you could, you could refuse the inspection, and what we'll do is get a warrant and come back at that time. 
We issue, um, we'll, we'll serve our own subpoenas, we'll serve our own warrants. Obviously, a, a judge would have to sign a warrant, but we would get a warrant and come back. And we've done that. Does it happen? Like, how often does that happen? So I'm not going to tell you the industry that might happen, but um, it, it does happen. Um, what if you have this crumble? I'll just tell you it happens. Um, <laughs> And, and I can let you know also, um, it, it's not unusual, we, um, we'll issue a subpoena. Um, what, there was a, what was? I got it. Oh, okay. So what if you have an employee that refuses to cooperate? Say you have a, a situation on a job site and the employee for whatever reason knows that they were they were guilty in some form of fashion of helping to assist with this injury happening and the employee just absolutely refuses to cooperate with osha or its employer so he, he can refuse to speak to me he certainly can you can refuse to speak to me but if i feel that it's pertinent to my case that i, I need to speak to you um, that's where the subpoena might come in play but if the employer is willing to cooperate, but his employee isn't, then well, I can't do it. With the employee, and I will, I will speak to the employee. So typically, I'm trying to think if I've ever seen that where um, the employee didn't want to speak to me because we're the Department of Labor, right? We're ensuring they have a, a safe work environment. So typically, an employee is not going to refuse to speak to us because. I mean, we're trying to make a safe work environment for that employee. Um, but they could refuse to speak to us if they wanted to. If they, if they didn't want to give the statement, they didn't want to talk, then that's fine. Um, Is there a checklist for the marine contracting industry as far as the rules and regulations? What and how? And then that could be used on a job site. You can you know, post that guys, these are the rules and regs, and have that on the job site, and they have to maintain. I'm standards. thinking that we have a, a sheet for maritime, um, for inspections. Let me look that up, and I'll, I'll, I'll email it to you, okay? And then you can get it out. To, but I believe there is a, um, I'm trying to remember um, last time I went to a, a, a maritime facility, um, other than a, like a port. Like um, life jacket is needed then. Yeah, well, I can tell you if you're working around the water, you're going to need a life jacket, okay? Um, so, so, so. You're on the land, what, adjacent to the water, working on the cap or something like that? Is that required? Six feet. If, if, Six feet? if, if yeah. you, if there's a possibility of, of you falling. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah. Uh, there's another one you and I discussed on the phone. Um, what about the marine contractors that when they're working and say they're in shallow water, where they're like four or five feet of water, but maybe they're trying to do cross anchors and things on the dock, the pilings and stuff, and they have a hookah rig on the site. Do they have to be certified divers? Yeah, I, I remember that we talked about the. I didn't remember all that description you just gave, but um, that's right. If if you're doing work and you're using, um, say you you're diving and you're using a hookah rig, uh, you fall under the OSHA regs. And I'm I'm going to tell you now, if you're doing diving work and there's an accident like the trenching, you're going to see me. Um, I do the the dive sites. Um, but what if they're not diving? They're just 12 inches below the water just so they can get enough air so they can get the stuff up. No, that, that's considered, um, that is considered, um, that falls under the OSHA regs. You're doing work at that time, so. Um, so what do we do to get that law changed? Get what? What do we do to get it changed? Because The law change? <laughs> Good luck, I don't, I don't know. Because <laughs> uh, if you harvest oysters, you can do it. Why can't we do it? I don't know. Well, what do we do to change it? And that I don't know either. <laughs> Who do we talk to? I guess your congressman. Okay. Is that where we start? Congressman. Again, I don't know where you would start, but if, if you're talking about making laws and getting laws changed, that's not somebody, I'm not the person well, you talk it's to. something that affects how we make money. And if someone who can harvest oysters can die because it affects their livelihood, 
why can't we do it and have some regulation so it's safe. And like less than four feet of water or less than three. I mean, well, with some regulations with, with depth. Yeah. I mean, we, it, there would be some regulations to it, but if it affects how we make a living, it has importance to us. And well, that's out of my, my realm of influence. So when OSHA makes, okay, so when OSHA implements new rules, like say, for the example, the situation with crane operator certification, where does that come down from? Does that, that come down from a court of law? Does that come down? It comes from down from national office. That's Washington, D.C. Okay, so that's who we need to. Yeah, no, each office, the, the office doesn't invent the laws, and they, they don't, the director, now, that's another thing is, uh, there's no citation that goes out of that office that's not signed by the director. She makes the final decision, but um, sh she doesn't just make up um, what she wants to cite or not cite. Um, yeah. so all that's spelled out. Do there have to be a bill? Huh? Would there have to be a bill created? Would I don't know. Obvious to do it? I don't know. You're asking me things that are just out of my realm of influence. I think we need to call Washington, D.C. and ask them what the problem is. Like with the National Electric Code, there are code, code panels that are made up of industry people as well as government officials. Is that similar in OSHA where you have different uh, construction so you're, you're really asking me things that I'm not involved with, but my understanding is that, that normally if they're going to change laws that you have, you have some group that's together, they get with the industry, they get with um, the associations, everybody has input on it. It's not just a group of people that says, hey, we just want to make a law up and let's do this. Um, there's a lot of input, there's a lot of stakeholders, but that's kind of like with anything, that's a, just like a business making any decision for the company. They're going to bring their stakeholders in, if it's their vice president and their supervisors, to, to kind of um, figure out the best way to do things. Um, but again, that's out of, out of um, my realm, right? Anything else I can't answer? <laughs> I guess if you're doing that diving and you're holding your breath, that's cool. What? <laughs> well, you know, like the same thing with the hook and they're going down and working underwater. I mean, is it okay to hold your breath and do that? Or that's not, is that considered diving? You're diving. Yeah, no, I'm not, I'm not going to no. entertain this yeah, conversation. I, I, just, you know, I didn't realize the hook thing was against the, I, yeah, I didn't realize that was. Well, it's not against if, you, if you're I a know, certified I diver and you have a tender and well, you have a you know, I mean, I know recreationally. When you enforce a rule, is it in the Code of Federal Regulation? What is your book? What are you going by? So that's what it is, the CFR. That's right. Um, so, you, so I'll give you another example of that. So you can go to OSHA.gov, okay? And you can look at our standards. And some standards, um, they have interpretations on it. So if they're not clear to you, Somebody may have already asked that question and sent it up um, to the national office and have solicitors look at it, and they've made a determination based on that, and they might have, it's called an interpretation. So you can look at the standard, you can click on the standard, and you can get the different interpretations, how they view it, how it applies, what it doesn't apply to, and things of that nature. That's at OSHA.gov? OSHA.gov. That's just under our standards. Um, you just look up. And it'll be whatever you're looking at. If it's general industry, construction, maritime, um, whatever industry you're working in. You're familiar with the organization called Patty? So, um, so I see Patty, but that's, that's um, like if you're diving, and, and if I get a patty no. am I a certified diver? No. Recreational. Recreational. That's that doesn't that doesn't apply oh. to um and I and I that's an issue I see. Somebody brings a patty card to me. Um that's a that's that's that doesn't qualify for what is it? That's for recreational. I understand that. That's why I'm asking the question. I thought it was so you, you need to be a certified diver, so you'd have to find some agency to certify you. I mean, it's, it's going to be, that's a, that's a pretty detailed process. Yeah, that's, um, so what I recommend to a lot of people is really best if you hire a certified diver, in my opinion, is best if you hire a certified diver versus trying to um, 
unless that's the industry you're wanting to do. But if, if you're just, you have work here and there, you'd probably be better hiring it out versus trying to become a certified diver to commercial diver. So it's certified commercial diver. Uh, I'm not telling you that's the title of it, but yeah, it's um, you've got to be a commercial diver and you'd be certified to do that. So I know we're getting a little off here on this, but yeah. like I've seen pool companies using hooker rigs to fix the pool. Would they technically be a car diver? Technically. Wow. Yeah, you you got to be careful with that because yeah. okay. if something happens down there, um, you, you just never know. I see a lot of accidents and you, and you look back and think, wow, how, you know. Um. How does the general public follow up on a known accident? One of the things we had several years ago. Wait, on a what? Known accident. Okay. There was a project out to bid to do some lake bank restoration, and one of these groups that sucks up sand and pumps it into a bag sent a guy out with scuba gear. He got entangled in something, drowned in a lake. The last I heard was nothing came out of it because he was trespassing. The bit did not say you can dive in our lake. He was doing that road. So what you have to know is the name of the company, and you go to OSHA.gov, you can search up that establishment um, and see if there was an OSHA investigation opened under it. Thank you. Well, thank you very much. That's it? Yeah. All right. Thank you. Thank you.